Okay, welcome back for part B, lecture five. So at the by the second century, Rome, there's no doubt about it, this is a, an extensive empire, extremely impressive. Rome dominates the Mediterranean. Previously, Carthage had dominated the Western Mediterranean and the Greek states had dominated the Eastern Mediterranean. Now it's all Rome. And Rome now has access to silver and to gold. And so, again, bronze uh, currency, while it will still be used as a subsidiary currency to some degree, it's all about silver and gold at this point. And, and, and here, at, uh, in this stage of Roman history, we see the introduction of the denarius. The denarius, one of the, maybe the most famous coin in all of world history. The denarius was introduced sometime around 211 BC. Its weight initially was four and a half grams, which amounts to uh, about one fifth of an ounce of silver. And it was uh, a very uh, pure silver coin. It was about 95% fine. You look at some of the images here. There's Caesar, Julius Caesar. This was a, uh, a coin issued by Mark Antony, the uh, Roman legion. There's Mark Antony, there's Cleopatra, and there is uh, Mark Antony's chief rival, rival Octavian. Octavian was the uh, adopted son, essentially, of Caesar, so after Caesar was assassinated, there was a battle for power between these two men. Octavian wins out and uh, rechristens himself Augustus, Caesar Augustus. But the denarius, again, the most important coin in, in world history, I think you can say. And uh, its impact, I think, we, we, we don't even realize. Uh, the Spanish word for money, dinero, dinero. Well, where does that come from? It comes from this, denarius. The Italian word for money is Denar, D-E-N-A-R, that comes from denarius or denarius. And then to this day in many North African states and in parts of the Middle East, the principal currency unit, the unit of account, is a dinar, D-I-N-A-R, that comes from the denarius. So huge impact and, and these coins are emitted in great quantities after the defeat of Carthage there's a lot of looting of Carthage and the, the Carthage, Carthage Empire, but also um, access to these mines. And it was a lot more convenient, again, than bronze. One silver denarius equaled approximately 16 bronze osses, uh, we'll, we'll pronounce it. And, you know, so you think of all the, and each os was about a pound of bronze. That's, you know. Obviously, the silver denarius was a far more convenient coin. First became dominant in uh, uh, the early part of the third century BC, the denarius did, and it was used for about 450 years. A long time, the denarius ruled Roman exchange in the exchange of the Mediterranean world. The plural, plural form of denarius is denarii. There was some gold emitted as well. There were gold mines in northwestern Spain. When the Romans conquered the British Isles, there were a few gold mines in uh, western Wales. And, uh, and actually a bit later in the second century AD, the Romans invaded Transylvania, which today is, uh, is located in Romania, primarily because there were gold mines in Transylvania. And so, uh, we do see emissions of gold. Here we have um, the uh, rough equivalent, one gold aureus, and you'll remember it in the periodic table, AU is for gold. One gold aureus was roughly equal to 25 silver denarii. So if you could obtain gold, uh, so obviously only gonna be for the wealthiest citizens. This is uh, a, a 
the most valuable of, of the coins. Here's another Aureus coin. All of these coins, by the way, were struck by the hammer as opposed to uh, cast into molds as the Chinese created their coins. And as I alluded to earlier, there, there, were, there was still a subsidiary coinage, small change, bronze and copper coins that people could use. But this, the denarius was plentiful enough to where uh, soldiers, wage earners actually possessed and traded in uh, denarii, silver coins. In the, in the images, the messages communicated on these coins were quite powerful. This was a coin introduced by supporters of Brutus. Brutus, of course, assassinated, was involved in a conspiracy to, to assassinate Julius Caesar on the Ides of March, 44 BC. And this coin commemorated the Ides of March again, issued by the supporters of Brutus, who were ultimately taken down by Mark Antony and Octavian. But pretty cool coin. All right, the empire. So, you know, why not the Republic? Well, the Republic got too big for itself. Uh, you, you saw the map there, it's, it's far reaching. And, you know, the, the quaint, system of, of the old Senate in Rome with the consul just wasn't cutting it anymore. In the first half of the first century BC, there were all sorts of civil wars between ambitious rivals uh, within the Roman Senate. And then you know, finally it, uh, culminated in Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon in 49 BC. Some historians trace the beginning of the Roman Empire to 49 BC. Other historians trace it to uh, to uh, the uh, 27 BC when Octavian, who was the, again, the adopted son of Caesar, was given, granted extraordinary powers by the Roman Senate and uh, became emperor and gave himself the title Augustus, which meant illustrious one. And so whichever date we choose, by 27 BC, this is a very different type of system political system in Rome is the greatest empire the world had ever seen by the dawn of the first millennium AD. Look at this map of Rome in one, by the beginning of the second century AD. Just absolutely incredible. Caused a whole lot of problems. Uh, a lot of the European peoples who uh, the Romans referred to as barbarians, resisted their rule. But, you know, very far-flung empire, and it was also a very expensive empire. You need troops in all sorts of different areas, and so that's going to create some, some real problems for Rome. But for a while, this early empire was extraordinarily prosperous. The main export from Rome was grain, um, but they deal with all, all types of um, goods and merchandise and foodstuffs. Everything you could you could really think of. They engage the Romans engage with trade with trade as far as China. So you may, may remember from the last lecture, under the Han Dynasty, when the use of cash coins really began to explode. The Han Dynasty is in power right at this time, and it was under the Han Dynasty that the Silk Road was constructed. Well, that Silk Road went about four thousand miles, and so the Romans traded goods to the Chinese via that route and use uh, middlemen merchants along the way. The Romans also traded with India and uh, they accessed India by making use of Egyptian ports along the Red Sea. Just, uh, and then if you, if you take a look at the internal economy within the Roman Empire, just incredible network of roads that made transportation within the empire, greatly eased transportation within, within the empire and the flow of money within the empire and other just incredible inventions. Aqueducts, which allowed for transporting water over long distances. 
This is a famous aqueduct at uh, Pont du Gard in southern France. I actually traveled here, uh, visited this aqueduct um, back in 2007. Just absolutely phenomenal structure. So at the peak of the empire, lots of gold and silver coins. But like I said, this was an expensive empire. Now, not everywhere in the empire used these specific coins. On the in the colonies, on the peripheries of the empire, the Romans allowed for provincial coins, provincial mints, and these local mints were sometimes a continuation of the older currency before before the Roman conquest, and this was done in large part as a matter of expediency. These coins tended to be, uh, did not have the same value as, you know, the full on silver denarius or the gold coins. It consists, it comprised of a lot of bronze. So a baser coinage, and it was mostly limited to circulation within that local area. And at the height of the Roman Empire, you had as many as 600 of these local mints all throughout the empire. They're located especially in the east and, and tended to be in, in former Greek states or along the eastern Mediterranean. So the variety of these different coinages and sort of the, the, on the peripheries of the empire creates a demand for money changing. If you have local coin and it's you know and you need to change it out for a coin that will be accepted elsewhere in the empire, you're going to need money changing services. And we talked a little bit about money changing last time when we looked at Greece. So money changing continues as a as an occupation, and also uh, sort of early banking again. And this time under Romans, unlike the Greeks and unlike the Babylonians or the Egyptians. This takes place privately, not in the temples. And so merchants who had liquid assets are accepting deposits. They're lending out money at interest. Now, the activity was very limited. Um, and, and, well, for one, the Romans generally preferred cash transactions, so they're not recording a lot of monetary transactions in, in uh, book or with book accounts. Uh, but especially when uh, the, with the onset of Christianity in the early part of the first millennium, the belief began to uh, spread that interest, charging interest or usury, was unethical or immoral. And so banking toward the end of the Roman Empire took a back seat and actually didn't reemerge again until the Renaissance era. But we do see it sort of an early form of that here in the Roman Empire. And interestingly enough, our word for bank comes from this period. So these merchants, these Roman merchants, set up uh, in the cities these long tables, these long benches that they that in the Latin was called a bancu, a bancu. The Italians then later resurrected that word banco for the same activity, money changing and loaning at interest. And that, of course, is where we get the word bank. But yeah, this was a, a big activity, and, and in fact. If you're familiar with the Gospels, uh, you're no doubt uh, you have no doubt heard the story of Jesus overturning the tables of the money changers in the temples uh, in, in the temple at Jerusalem. So in the temple, there were all sorts of money changers that changed out money, so that because you had all sorts of people who traveled far and wide to visit the temple, and you had money changers there who were making profit, and they were there in the temple. Jesus went in, overturned their tables, and said, this is my father's house, this is a house of prayer, not a den of thieves or a den of vipers, and uh, overturned overturn their, their, their tables. One of the more famous accounts in, in, uh, in the Gospels, but that hearkened to this, to this idea of money changing in, in ancient Rome. So we're going to we'll stop here in for part C, we're going to look at the notorious debasement of the denarius and the debasement of the Roman currency in the late Roman Empire. See you for part C.